yeah, uh, as Mark said, I'm very happy about this conference. I'm really happy to see you guys and that you guys could make it. And I'm really not a very good speaker, but I will try to do my best. <laughs> and sorry for my French accent. <laughs> so yeah, so this is, uh, is going to be a one-hour keynote about uh, the state of Ruby motion, the basically the past, the present, and the future. So if we look at Ruby motion uh, yesterday in the past, uh, it was a, it was about two years ago when I started uh, the project. Actually, I was uh, I was working for a uh, for a company here in the Bay Area that makes uh, fruits, uh, <laughs> or uh, well, I was working for Apple, and I decided to leave the company to do my own thing. And because I couldn't uh, I couldn't stay in in America, I had to go back to my home country. Uh, my own country of Belgium, and when I think about Belgium, I think about this. This is the best picture I have in mind for uh, for Belgium. It's actually a beer. It's uh, probably the best beer I've seen, and I think Mark would probably uh, agree with me or not. <laughs> Disagree. <laughs> anyway, uh, I work uh, for about eight months on Ruby Motion, and I think I think it was in May 2012. I think it was the fourth May. Uh, we actually shipped it. And I was very, um, I was very surprised about all the interest that this project uh, received. I really didn't expect that. I thought it would be a failure, actually. So uh, I'm, ex I was extremely ex excited. And I think that, with well, the first day we released it, we had this huge article on Ars Technica, which gave us a lot of attention. And then it started growing very fast. And uh, today, uh, Remotion is really not what it used to be two, uh, two years ago. Uh, first, I'm not the only one working on Remotion anymore. That's a good thing, because uh, we can get more, um, uh, more releases and more bug fixes. And actually, we are five people. Uh, we are actually three people full-time and two people part-time. So the two guys that you saw, just a few seconds ago, where um, our full-time people. Uh, Elo is working from Amsterdam, actually on a boat. He lives on a boat, which is great, right? He's actually building a new boat, so he's really a boat person. And that's, that's what I can say about Eloy. <laughs> uh, she's also known as Watson, lives near uh, Tokyo, Japan. And Watson is like our, our bug fixer. He fixes bugs when we, when we sleep. So this is great. You wake up and you can see bugs fixed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I work from Belgium, but I, I just drink beer and eat waffle all the day. So I don't really do stuff. And then we have, we have two part-time guys. We have Colin, of course, who's going to uh, speak later today or tomorrow. I don't know. Not today, right? Today. And Colin is our uh, community manager. He does... He maintains the Google group. He does all the interviews on our blog. And Colin lives in uh, Denver, Colorado. So I must excuse if I didn't put the pin correctly. I'm not really good at geography. <laughs> but I think Colorado should be right there. And finally, we have a, we have a, uh, we have a French guy uh, who lives in uh, Aix-en-Provence. Um, and you know what? Because of the stress, I forgot his, his name. Geoffrey. Geoffrey, man. That's going to be tough. He's going to hurt me. <laughs> yeah. And Geoffrey is, uh, is very lucky to live in south of France. Uh, and he helps us with support. And anyway, uh, we are actually doing very well. And a lot of people are always afraid that uh, it's a startup and we don't have um, VC money. We actually bootstrap 100%. And we didn't take investors' money. And we're actually doing well. <laughs> oh. And I can't really uh, tell you um, how much money we make, but I can, I can show you uh, this graph <laughs> that I made a few days ago. And I can't, I can't give you the actual numbers, but we are, uh, we are doing actually very well. And we don't really need uh, investors' money at this point. It's well doing well. I'm, I also manage the company very um, conservatively. So. So we are doing great. And we have a lot of cash in the bank also. So if there is anything that could happen, we could actually uh, remain maintain RubyMotion for at least a few more years. 
And actually, I'm very um, excited that Ruby Motion is used by uh, a lot of people actually today. And I would like to show you a few, a few of these guys. And first with Jukeli. And Jukeli is a very nice application uh, that you can use with your friends to find concerts. They first uh, launched in New York City, and now they are available in most cities in America. And it's actually a great app. It's very well polished. The design is awesome. And it's all written in Ruby Motion. And Colin here is actually uh, working for Jukeli. Uh, it's his main job. And so this is very nice. And Jimdo is also one of our other success story. Um, it's actually um, it's some sort of an application to make websites. It's from Germany, but it is extremely popular. And their uh, iPhone and iPad app is written in Ruby Motion. And I just discovered recently that uh, Gillian Anderson, the actress, is using the application. And she's well, I really um, I like her. I, I was a big fan of the X5, so this is big for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bandcamp is also another great success story. It's an app that actually is basically uh, some sort of a network of independent artists where they can publish their music. And their iPhone app is all written in Ruby Motion. And it is, a, it's a, it is actually a very interesting app. You can stream music uh, right away. And they actually put the music in the background if you actually shut, shut your phone off and start it again. So it's all written in Ruby Motion and they make very nice. Uh, very interesting uh, things with uh, uh, all, the, all the APIs of iOS. Oh, we also have Frontback. Uh, Frontback is a very uh, popular app. Basically, you take a picture of you and then what you see, and they make like um, a picture with both pictures. And they have a social network based on it. It's actually very, very popular. Uh, I think my wife uses it without even knowing that it's written in Ruby Motion. Uh, <laughs> It's pretty big. And oh, uh, a little bird told me that they just got over 1 million downloads. So it's probably the largest Ruby Motion uh, installation. Oh, and finally, we have a dark room. Um, this is like a text based uh, action game, more or less, probably more like an adventure game. And it was usually a web app, and a guy named uh, Amir Raja decided to port it to iOS, to, to the iPhone. And uh, so don't really look over the graphics because they're all text-based and it's all buttons and text fields. But the game is extremely addictive. And it went, f it actually, I think it was a few weeks ago, it was the number one paid app on the US App Store. So the entire US App Store, including all the apps, from including the apps from Apple, uh, a dark room was over that. It was the number one. And then I think it stayed out for 15 days. So this is extremely addictive. And I, I never played because I don't have time for that. <laughs> I know that <laughs> I'm a weak person. But my wife actually played for a few weeks, and she said that it was extremely addictive. And anyway, um, today we have this conference, and I'm really uh, excited about that because um, there is no way I could have told you that we would have a conference in San Francisco two years ago. Uh, if, you could, if you could actually go back in time with a time machine and uh, tell my past self that we would do that. I would ask you what you are smoking and if you still have some. <laughs> but for me, it's like, it's like a big achievement. Anyway, we are not here for that. We are here for uh, tomorrow, right? And I would like to show you what tomorrow will be for Ruby Motion. So it's going to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, the future is flat. <laughs> So here we go. Uh, on the left side, you have the old Ruby Motion logo. Well, not the old, the current one. <laughs> and on the right, you have the, the new one. So I would like you to take a few seconds to actually look really and convince yourself that the logo on the right is the best, right? <laughs> it, it, took, it took me some time to uh, get over it. Uh, I didn't design it, of course, but it took me some time. And now I'm pretty confident it's the best logo. OK? So we have this nice uh, typeface also, like a nice font that goes with the logo. It looks, it looks good, I think. And anyway, the future is really about Ruby Motion uh, 3.0. And today, we would like to show you a sneak peek of Ruby Motion 3.0. And we would like to show you uh, three features. 
So you see, Ruby version 3, three features. <laughs> there, there might be more features in Ruby version 3, but today we like to show you three of them. And the feature number one is performance. And for that, I would like to welcome uh, Shizuo on stage. Watson. Hi, good morning. I'm Shizuo Fujital. Call me Watson. <laughs> I'm very happy to see all of you today. Thank you for coming. The first future, uh, we've changed many Ruby motion internal for performances. So the subject in my section is improvement to Ruby motion performance. Okay, let's begin. The first, uh, I handled two topics in my section. The first topic, I'll show you uh, performance measuring tool. Okay. I created two gems for measuring performance. These are motion benchmark and the motion benchmark IPS. These were created for CRuby MRI with other also. I just repackaged this library for Ruby motion. So motion benchmark and motion benchmark IPS have method which are compatible with original libraries. Okay. Motion benchmark can measure the time of executing the method or processing. The time will be displayed on terminal, like this, pic like this picture. Very useful. And Motion benchmark, can, uh, motion benchmark IPS can measure how, uh, how many times it executes the method per second, like this picture. I measured Ruby motion performance using these libraries. Okay. Next, second topic. I'll show you how much we've improved Ruby motion performance. First, method dispatch. Method dispatch is about the time of method calling. Mean, it means <coughs> uh, booting time of method. This is, uh, this is simple code in this slide. If you select our method, which have simple content like this code, hmm. you can measure the performance of method dispatch. Method dispatch is now 1.8 times faster. This performance influences almost of Ruby and Objective method calling. So this performance is imp important. Okay, next. This is literal syntax for range object. Range, ob range object will be created two times two times. Huh? 2 times and uh, 2.2 uh, 2 .2 times faster than Ruby motion 2.0 using literal syntax great performance okay next this is literal syntax for string object string object will be created 1.6 times faster great and this is string interpolation code. 
it is 1.8 times faster. Literal and interpolation are very basic syntax and very important because I think everyone using these syntax so many, many times. So very important. Okay, next. This is string concatenation using string plus method. It is 1.8 times faster. And this is an array concatenation. It is 1.5 times faster. We have improved many, many performance. Unfortunately, I can show you all of performance in my section. So in here, I picked up some performance in this table. Okay. I'm sure you can find RubyMotion has made great performance now. So I will publish a table in online for more detail. Okay, now RubyMotion has great performance than 2.0. And we will continue to improve RubyMotion performance. If you find slow performance, please tell us we will fix it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would like to point out that this is the first time Watson gives a presentation in English. So I think. <laughs> I think he did a great job. <laughs> and so for feature number two, I would like to welcome Eloy on stage. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to see you all. And I would like to talk to you all later on, uh, hopefully all. So for my section, we are going to talk about the REPL. Uh, probably one of Rub the Ruby's best friends. And um, while uh, RubyMotion is probably, has been the leader of the pack in the Objective-C developer tool arena with regards to a REPL, uh, we have a feature such as a view selection. It has always been just that, one code line evaluation. Um, so it's great to try out something, but if you have tried it out and you want to bring it back to your code base, you have to remember to either copy paste it and well, I mean, it's annoying. You'll get all the extra syntax as well. So it's great to try out APIs to query the current state of your application. But arguably, we, we need something better to, uh, for your application development process. Because, well, yeah, this is so last week, the, a simple REPL. So we need something better. Enter real code base reloading. Um, with this in place, it will finally be possible to develop your application without having to quit, recompile, and relaunch your application. Um, just as Epic Cat intended. Okay, so before we get into the details, let's speak, uh, let the demo speak a thousand words. Okay, so since everybody works on timer applications, it's probably a good way to show it. Um, this is one of the demo applications that comes with the, the Ruby uh, uh, sample uh, code repository. And here I o I've already launched it. Uh, it's running. And here is the code for it. So while it's running, um, I figured that eh, white and blue, it's just, it's just too, too conformant. Um, so what we can do, for instance, is change some colors, change, flip the frames, change some colors, just save, and there you go. Oh.
it's purple, but apparently not that much that visible, so let's change that back to white in this case. <coughs> there you go. Okay, so that's that. Um, but, I mean, this is not a typical Ruby application, right? Ruby motion application. We, we're running on Objective-C runtime, and there's many run, run loop sources going on at the same time, probably. Um, in this case, we're going to show that by a simple NS timer, but in your case, that could be delegates uh, coming in from, I don't know, maybe a web view or, oh no, you don't have that on iOS, but <laughs> any other type of source. So for instance, let's start the timer here. Oh, something happened. Let's go to the terminal, and the terminal's too large. Right, so a message was sent, timer Fred, uh, that has to be timer fired. So because obviously uh, I'm, a, I'm a developer and I make mistakes all the time, um, I just say that now to make you feel good. Um, so I misspelled it here. What would happen normally at runtime if this came in from a run loop source is that your application would just crash. On iOS, on the main thread, run loop uh, ha raising an exception means a crash. On OS X, it's slightly different, arguably more annoying, um, but this is what would happen. So what we do is, uh, because this is something that, that you will run into, is we, we catch all those, and in this case it asks you, would you like to redirect this message so that it can just keep on working, or would you just sim like to ignore it? In this case, let's redirect it to timer fired. Oh. I'm just gonna hit enter, you know, it's not on screen right now. And there it goes, it will just redirect to the right place. Hmm. Okay, clearly I need to fix the, the UI there. Um, anyway, so that's running, that's nice, but now that I, let's say I change something else and I, I, I save again, you see it jumps back, right? Because in this case, it, it's, it's getting reset in the few will appear method, but the timer is still running, and that might not be what you want. So clearly, we're doing the naive thing. We're just calling your view will appear, which will work in most cases for just the simple stuff. But if you need more, we ha what we actually do is we define a method on all UI view controllers called Ruby Motion Did Reload Source, and this will be called by on your view controllers, and you get to do whatever custom resetting or ever you need to be able to get like the, the best feedback loop. So if we save this, then it should just reset back to initial state. And yeah, that's pretty much the demo for, well, I mean, it's pretty clear that this should be able to get you your application developed pretty quickly. Let's do the dance again. <laughs> All right, so just a bit more on the details. Uh, yes. Traditionally, this is what, in Ruby Motion 2, this is what happens, right? So the tool chain, you, start, you, you hit the build command, the compiler will compile all of your source. It will tell the sim tool to launch your application and it will set up the REPL, but that's that. So now what happens is that the sim tool will start watching all of your project files, including resource files and what have you. Um, and anytime it detects a change to any of those files, it will tell the compiler to recompile it on the fly and the sim tool will inject it into your application again. Um, and like I showed before, that's the arrow should have been a bit more to the left, Laurent. <laughs> I guess your OCD wanted it in the center of the big thing. Um, yeah, right, so obviously just injecting is not enough because the application will be running and you will need some kind of way to reflect the state as you want it, so you get the Ruby Motion did reload source uh, me message sent. And by default, that message will be implemented on all your view controllers and it will call view will appear and view did appear which may or may not be enough for your uh, controller. Uh, you may override it completely or call super, and it receives the file names of the files that we reloaded if you need to perform some reflection on that to see if that's the view controller that you want to actually work on. So to conclude, um, there are definitely still some corner cases. For instance, with OS X applications, some people like to develop their OS X application in running inside a sandbox, obviously, to test that it will work as intended but that means that you're not allowed to make any file system changes inside the resources directory of the application bundle. 
Um, so we'll probably have to add some uh, runtime patching of methods such as uh, NS image, image named, so that it actually also looks in one of the directories where it is allowed to make changes. But we expect those types of issues to be ironed out all during the next month where we'll work together with people working on real applications and give them the op opportunity to give us feedback. Um, well, that's it. Back to Laura. Thank you, Eloy. Okay, and uh, I'm going to show you the last feature that we want to show you today. And the feature number three is a new platform. Oh, I will try to speak in the microphone. Right. So the new platform, <coughs> we actually thought a lot and we got a lot of feedback from you guys, and we decided to implement uh, BlackBerry <laughs> support. <coughs> <coughs> Because Bla BlackBerry has this huge market share, and I think pretty much 90% of our customers ask for BlackBerry support. So here we go, Ruby Motion for BlackBerry. I'm not joking, by the way. No, I'm joking. Okay. So can you guess what the new platform is? Android. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. So why did we actually port WebMotion to Android? Because we already have iOS, right? Well, the reason is that uh, uh, Android has a much bigger market share. There are lots of people who really want to do Android applications. So I took, I took these numbers from uh, Google yesterday. Uh, I typed Android market share and I found these numbers. Uh, so I'm not sure if they're correct, but clearly it, Android is winning in a way. And this is for the smartphones, and this is for the tablets. And in 2012, uh, apparently, according to this website, uh, iOS was has a bigger market share over Android. But now it's different. Uh, iOS is shrinking, Android is growing. And this is the numbers from last year. So maybe this year it's going to be different. But clearly, uh, there is some interest in writing applications for uh, Android, and right now you have to write applications in Java using Eclipse and writing XML files. You see where I'm coming? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and with RubyMotion 3.0, you can finally write full-fledged uh, Android apps in Ruby. So you don't have to use Java. <laughs> okay. So this is Hello World in Java. <laughs> so it's, it's actually not that bad. It's, I think it's better than Objective-C, honestly. But uh, so we create an activity, which is a class. It inherits from Android app activity. Uh, we have this method on create that you have to overwrite to, to actually customize the user interface. And here we actually create a text view. We set the, the text property of the text view to uh, hello world. And then we assign uh, the text view as the content view of the activity, right? Because this is very simple, hello world. You can actually uh, shrink the constant lookups in Java by importing the packages. But here I wanted to make it as short, as short as possible. And this is the same in Ruby Motion. And this is this, no, Java, Ruby, <laughs> Java, Ruby. So actually, uh, as you can see, you can type text equal instead of set text, the same as in iOS. And you can just create classes and inherit from Android classes, Java classes, exactly as in iOS, like you would inherit from Objective-C classes. Uh, what else? Yeah, you can, you can build a literal string here, hello world, and pass it to Android, and it works just like in iOS, Ruby version for iOS, or an OS 10 also, I should say that. But anyway, I'm going to show you very quickly how it works. So, of course, you get to use a simple command line interface, actually the exact same command line interface that you use to build uh, iPhone and iPad and Mac apps. So, to create a new project, you type motion create dash dash template Android, then the name of the project is going to create a directory with a bunch of files in it. 
So it will be exactly the same. It's exactly the same as if you already use a revolution. Honestly, same experience. So we have a rake file by default, and in the rake file, we have a bunch of uh, tasks already predefined. So obviously, the default task is going to compile the application and run it in the Android emulator right here. But it takes a lot of time. Like you, you don't you don't even imagine. Like honestly, uh, you need to be very patient if you want to use the Android emulator. So uh, we really recommend to run on the device. If you have an Android device, you just plug it. And actually, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to get a certificate or a provisioning profile. Android is awesome. So you just plug it and type break device. Honestly, that's all you, all you have to do. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You have to enable debugging on the device. So that's just a um, three-step, but it's very easy. Yeah, Android is very easy for developers. Um, so you type break device, and then it starts on the device. Here it's a Nexus 7. It's my main Android machine. But it works on, we, we actually try it on Samsung phones, and there is no reason why it, it wouldn't work elsewhere. And it runs right away. Uh, it actually installs the application, then it runs, it starts the main intent of your activity. I'm trying to get into Android programming, but I think that's what it does. And then you actually, uh, it starts logging messages, and all the messages logged by the application will actually be in your uh, terminal. So once you're ready and you want to ship your Android app to the world, you can type break, uh, release. And it's going to build the application, but then at one point it's going to ask for uh, the, the code signing uh, key store that should be used to, uh, to, to actually code sign the APK. And for that, you actually need to generate a key store file yourself. But the great thing is that you don't have to, uh, to do that with Google. You can generate the key store on your machine and then save it somewhere, say probably on a safe place, and then just use it. So you don't have to get the certificate from Google either. So it's actually very easy. And once you do that, you type the password, and then you get a APK file that you can just give to people or give to Google. And for a Hello World, this is what you get. So it's about half a megabyte. Uh, we actually actually work a lot to get, to get it. Uh, someone is calling you, Colin. <laughs> I'm not going to take the call, right? <laughs> OK, let's, let's keep on. So you actually get an APK file. An APK file is more or less a zip archive. But here, as you can see, it's half a megabyte, which is great. There is actually a limit on the, the, um, the APK, APK size. Um, I'm a bit stressed out, so I don't remember. I think it's 10 megabyte or 15 megabyte. And if you go over that, you need to ask Google permission to have virtual disks attached to your application, so it's kind of weird. But here, it's half a megabyte, so by default. So if you start adding code, it should actually not grow uh, that fast. Uh, all, the, all, the, um, all the big files will actually be resource files. So it's great. Uh, there are actually many, many platforms that do Android development, and by default, you have a five megabyte application. So this is very important. And obviously, you keep to use your favorite editor. Uh, that's one of the main interests of RubyMotion, right? So, <coughs> if you really don't like Xcode <laughs> and you try to use Eclipse, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, it's, it's way worse than Xcode, honestly. X compared to, um, Eclipse compared to Xcode is like, uh, I don't know, it's like hell and something before hell. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, to show you how bad Eclipse is, um, uh, two days ago, I opened an Android project that I I created a few uh, months ago. So I just I just use Eclipse and do, did open project, and I, this is what I got. And I have all this red stuff in front of each line, and I have no idea how to fix that. I tried, and it says oh, I can't find the package. And I said okay, and it's it's really really weird. Honestly, I have no idea how Eclipse works. Maybe I'm I'm pretty stupid about uh, Eclipse. I know people actually like it, but it's really hard. Uh, it's also very slow. So obviously, uh, I prefer to use Vim uh, to write apps. And you can use any uh, text editor with RubyMotion for Android. And actually, if your editor supports syntax, uh, you will have auto-completion for Java APIs. And I have, only, I have only tried it with Vim because I think everyone should be using Vim. But 
Uh, if you have enough memory on your computer, you can try Emacs. I, 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 don't have enough, I don't have enough memory on my machine. I have only four gigabytes, so I can try Emacs. But on, on Vim, it actually works nice. And this is just, uh, oh, this is the timer app. You return 400, so I'm going, going to show it to you after. And one of the one of the things also great with Ruby Motion for Android is that you don't have to write XML files. Um, if you have done a little bit of Android programming, uh, it's all about XML. Like, it's an XML file for the project, XML file for the resources, XML file for the strings. Uh, it's like ins it's like insanely XML. Like you live in XML. And here uh, you can actually write the user interface in code, so no need to use XML files for layouts. The project file is actually a rec file, so you need to use XML files for the Android. Uh, manifest. The Android manifest is generated for you. So the idea is really to uh, not use XML and just use Ruby and your favorite editor. Thank you. <laughs> but this said, if you want to use XML, you can. There is nothing to, that prevents you. So in Ruby Motion project, Ruby Motion for Android project, there is a resource directory where you have all these application level resource files. And you can create, a, I think it's a string subdirectory, and put your XML files there. And you can create a layout subdirectory and put your layout XML files there. So it, you can do the same thing as Google recommends you. But honestly, uh, we recommend to do that in code. A little bit like for iOS and OS 10, you don't, we don't recommend to use Interface Builder. Uh, it's the same here. And the great thing is that uh, we can finally share code between iOS, OS 10, and Android because it all uses the same language, Ruby. So obviously, if you write uh, an iPhone app and an Android app, uh, the user interface is going to be platform specific. So that will be very specific code that you write for, for example, Android activities and UI view controllers. But um, the rest of the code, the backend code, is actually portable. There is nothing iOS about it. And you can just, if you architecture a project well enough, you can share code between all these three platforms. And I think this is going to be a very big deal. <coughs> and now let's try a demo. And I'm going to pray the guts because this is very hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, You know what, I think I'm going to mirror the display. It's going to be better. You got a message. Uh, okay, it's okay, much better. So, well, let's go here. Uh, can you read the font? I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. OK, so let's go on PMP and create a new Android project. Uh, template called Android. Hello. And it creates a bunch of files. So I can get to arrow, and I can type rake device. And here, I actually have uh, Colin's phone connected to my computer. So if I type rake device, Oh, I forgot. That's a good thing. Because I need to c I need to set the rake file. I need to point the rake file to the uh, Android SDK and NDK. So this is only because I use this very early version of Ruby Motion. In the future, when you install it, you will provide it at, at installation time, and then it's all all good for your project. So yeah, I just have to provide the SDK pass and the NDK pass. Anyway, and I do that. I type rake device. It builds my application. It signs it. It Installs it on the on a uh, Colin's machine, and there we go. This one is right here, but actually, I can show it here. There we go. Can you see that? Okay, here we are using a BBQ screen, barbecue screen, I guess. It's like an Android app that you can use to um, mm, project the content of your Android device on your Mac. So we use it as some sort of uh, an emulator because the emulator is so slow, and here it's fast. So I'm going to put the... 
the device here. So yeah, by default, you have just hello and a black screen. So I'm gonna type something there. Or if I do Control C, it quits the application. Uh, now I can I can edit it. And so by default, as you can see, we have, we have our main activity, and we have our own create method, but we do simply nothing. We just call super. And now I'm going to do something. I'm going to create a text view. And each widget that you create in Android, you have to provide a reference to the activity. I think it's called a bundle. Honestly, I'm learning on Android the hard way, so. Then you can set the text property to something, and I will say, hello. OK, oops, let's close the string. Then I can type self.contentView. Assign it to my label, and we should be good to go. So I can go back here and type break device. We don't have code reloading yet for Android. We're working on it. And it starts the app, and oh, it's actually not connected. You see, that's the demo gods in action. Something here. Let's see why the right. Ah. It actually the message like the message is actually on the screen, but it's a program with the Android app to project it on the Mac. Um, do you have any idea for maybe changing the Wi-Fi? Oh, no, it's working. Okay. Okay, so we just had to reset the app. Yeah. So I'm going to start it again. Back here. Okay. Okay, here we go. You can see the message here. Hello, one, 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 one. So it's actually working. And actually, I can, if I, if, if you want, I can go there. How do you actually, how do you actually kill an application in Android? <laughs> I mean, uh, on. All, all the home button. Okay. Oh, no, I don't want to take a picture. <laughs> uh, I think Android is great for developers, but for users, it's. it's <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not. I'm not going to show you that because I'm afraid it will break the demo. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, Ruby Motion for Android app they start as fast as Java apps. There is no thing required. Um, of course, you, you expect that, but if you have tried to use a, a Roboto, which is GRuby for Android, uh, you might see that it takes like five seconds to bootstrap. And here it's just as fast as, um, uh, as, fast as Java apps. So now I would like to show you other, uh, a few other samples that uh, I've been working on. Okay, so here we have our hello, a very basic hello um, application. I can type break device to show it to you. And this is the same hello sample that we have for iOS. So it shows hello Ruby motion, and then you can click, right? And if you drag, it say, it's oh my god, and it just shows, okay, very simple. And I'm going, I'm gonna show you the source code. We have just one file for this sample. Here we create our uh, text. We actually set a bigger text size. It's because I use an Android uh, Nexus 7 at home, which is, a, which is a tablet. So I need a bigger font. And here on, on Colin's phone, it looks bigger. So yeah, you have a lot of resolution screens in Android. So you need to actually, it's not as easy as in iOS, I think. You need to make sure that you don't build UIs that are really, op that are optimized for all the platforms that you target. 
But anyway, here I have this method dispatch touch event, which is another method of the, the activity class that you can overwrite, and then you get callbacks when the user actually um, touches the main content view of your activity. And here I actually check if it's a uh, action up, which means that we actually up the, the finger from a touch event. I can just increase the counter, set the text, and what do I do here? I set the background color to black. Ah yes, because if we actually move, I, I set the text to, oh my god, and I, here I, I actually set the text to a um, completely random uh, color. So as you can see, uh, the rand um, method is actually implemented for the notion of rand read. Anyway, that's a very simple uh, app. I'm gonna show you uh, a few more. Oh, the paint one, oh, maybe the timer, yeah. Let's do for the timer. Boom. Here I have a timer app, and I can actually click here and start. And stop, start, stop, wow. Now you can make, now you can make money. <laughs> oh, no, 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 keep it that way. So yeah, timer app, very simple. Uh, let's see the source code quickly. Um, I have a button listener, which is some sort of a, a special class that we are actu yeah, that you actually pass to a button, and that will be uh, used. The onClick method of this class will actually be called when the button is tapped. Anyway, then I have a timer task, which uh, is an object that you pass to a, to a to an Android timer, and here the run method will be called. Anyway, here I have my main activity. I have my label somewhere on screen. Then I have my button somewhere on screen. And here I actually use uh, an Android widget linear layout, which is um, in Android, uh, you can actually build these interfaces based on layouts. And you have uh, vertical layouts, horizontal layouts, grid layouts. So it's very similar to um, Java something, Java structs, Java swing, Java swing, I think. Yeah, I, I learned some Java programming at school. It was AWT, Abstract Window Toolkit. Yeah, they actually take the same. I think it's very similar. So, and this is actually something I like because in iOS you don't have that. You have to build your own packing view. Well, now you have auto layout, but this is actually very nice. So here you can build your. Uh, I actually, I actually have a vertical layout view, and then I have two views that are packed vertically. I have my my label and my button. And here I set the gravity to center horizontal, which means that the view will be cent uh, centered vert uh, horizontally. Anyway, simple. I have a button that toggles my timer. Here I start my timer. Anyway, that's very simple. Oh, there is one thing that's actually interesting uh, that I, want I wanted to point to. Here at the beginning, I create an Android OS handler object. The reason is that in uh, if you use Android timers, your callback may actually be called from uh, another thread, not the main thread. And if you want in this callback to change the user interface here, I actually want to set a new value for my label. I want to increase the timer. I have to do that from the main thread. So what I do here is that here, when, when the onCreate method is called, I know it's the main thread. So I create my Android OS handler object, and I store it in an instance variable. Then. Here, here, when my timer runs, I actually use the post method and I pass a block, and I know that this block will actually be executed inside the main thread. So you can actually see uh, Android handlers a little bit like GCD. They are not really the same, but they you can actually send um, send uh, tasks to from one thread to the other. And what's great is that uh, normally you're supposed to pass an object that implements the runnable interface. But in RubyMotion for Android, procs implement runnable. So you can just pass a proc here. So this is nice, right? You can just do the lambda funky syntax. And you cannot do that in Java. You have to create an anonymous class, and this is insane. Anyway, simple app. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the paint one is funny. I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to show you the source code for this one. But it's a simple app, and you can start drawing lines. And each line has a different color. Then you have a clear button here that removes the screen. Actually, 
I can just show you quickly, yeah. We have uh, our home touch event here. Actually, this one is the big deal. The Android method on a very, here we actually subclass Android view view. Android view is a package and view is the class in the package. So here in RubyOcean for Android, you need to provide the whole thing. Android view view, that may sound weird, but that's the way it is. You overwrite on draw, and then you can, here we draw uh, on the canvas uh, all the passes that we actually generate when the on to event method is called. And oh, before showing the final one, I'm going to show you this one. Web view demo is a nice um, sample that shows you that how you can integrate a web view inside an Android app and then provide and expose uh, Ruby objects that web view. So here I have, uh, I have my simple, this is a web view. This is HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And here if I click the click me, I think it's a uh, element, unique set, I don't know. You click and as you can see, I have a message here from the terminal. The message is actually uh, printed the terminal then routed back to my Mac. And if I show you the source code, Let's see, uh, here we create a web view, then we actually specify here the demo JavaScript interface as for, for the web view, and demo JavaScript interface is actually right here. And it has this click on Android method. And this method will go from JavaScript. And the thing is that since Android API level 18, which I think is uh, KitKat, or I don't, I don't know, uh, you have to provide a special annotation to the methods that will be called from JavaScript. This is for security reasons. Actually, before API level 14, uh, all the methods were exposed to JavaScript and there were huge uh, security vulnerabilities like Android was very insecure. And then Google changed his mind and you need to uh, provide an annotation. And so in Java, uh, you can actually provide annotations to uh, a lot of things, at least methods and classes, pretty more. And annotations in Java are just objects. So here we actually extend the compiler, the Ruby Motion compiler, that, so that you can actually provide annotations. And here I provide the Android WebKit JavaScript interface annotation to my click on Android method. And if I show you the, oh sorry, the assets file, I actually have my, my demo HTML. And here, let's see. Here, as you can see, I, when you click the, when you actually hit the, the A HTML element, not sure what it's called, it's going to call a uh, click on Android. And it's going to call our Ruby method, which is great, right? I don't know. Anyway, and finally, I'm going to show you a funny app that I wrote actually a few days ago. It's called Conference, and it's actually an application for this conference. Yuppie. So it's as, as it's a uh, it's a scheduled application. It's it's really not as good as the iPhone version, because uh, because I'm bad at design and I I'm also learning under the hard way. But basically here we have a list view. It's actually a custom. Uh, it's actually a list view with, with a custom adapter. The adapter is what provides uh, the data and the look and feel for each row. So here we have a custom one because we have, as you can see, we have the, the time for each session, which is centered vertically. Then on the right, we have the title and then a description of the speakers. Oh, and the schedule is not up to date, by the way. We made last adjustments yesterday, so don't, don't read it too much. But we have a list here. And here we have this menu, this drawer. I'm actually going to put this here. And this drawer actually is this is not code that comes from uh, with Android SDK. It's actually code written by Google inside what they call the, an extra package. So the, this this extra library, this GAR, this jar, it ships with Android, but it's not part of the built-in Android APIs. So here, if you want to use it, you need to vendor it. So in RubyMotion for Android, you can actually vendor third-party Java libraries. And here, we actually vendor this tiny library written by Google, who's not part of Android. So it works exactly as you would expect in Java. So I can see the day two. 
can see the venue, and this is actually interesting. It actually shows the venue in Google Maps. And believe me, it took me a day to do that. Because uh, you, don't have a ma you don't have a map view in Android by default. You need to use the Google Play Services library. So it's a third-party library written by Google. So you need to vendor it, then you need to initialize all the map view stuff, you need to configure your Android manifest file to have all the permissions required for your app to actually connect to the um, Google Play something. Then you need to get an API key from Google to use map, um, Google Maps. So it's not that easy, but as you can see, it works fine in Ruby Motion. So all the, all the steps that are required normally in Java, you can do that in Ruby Motion. And I have a sponsor here, very simple. Oh, actually, if you click on the sponsors, it's gonna open the URL in, the, in Chrome. So that's called an intent, I think, in Android. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But the great thing is that here, if I actually go back, it goes back to my app. So there is some sort of a, a navigation thing going on here. And then we have the about screen here. Very simple. And I'm not going to show you the source code because it's not as uh, simple as the other samples, but it will be on GitHub later today. Okay, this is all for the demos. So I can actually go back up. It's a bit boring. Okay. <laughs> so. Thank you. So how does it work actually? That's a good question, right? So I'm gonna spend the last part of the talk explaining how it's implemented. So first let's talk about the runtime. And the runtime is Ruby. And more specifically, it's a brand new implementation of Ruby. So it's new code. Uh, we didn't actually take any code from Ruby Motion for Objective-C. I actually wanted originally, but then I realized that it wouldn't work. Uh, simply because we are trying to make uh, the best implementation of Ruby for Android development. And so there is pretty much nothing we can take from Ruby Motion for iOS. So it's brand new. So I, I, I told myself that I would never write Ruby again and I... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and the first thing is that it has a unified object model with Java. It is exactly the same ID as we implemented Ruby Motion for Objective-C, the Objective-C runtime. So basically, you have Ruby Motion and Java, and they are all running on the Dell Victor machine on Android. And here with Ruby Motion, we actually use the Java native interface to actually re-implement the entire Ruby object model on top of uh, the same uh, runtime that's going to power Java applications. So, and of course, on top of Dell you have the entire set of Android APIs that are written in Java. So from Ruby Motion, you can access all the Android APIs written in Java, that as you would do in in, um, in actually in actual Java code. The, the the runtime model is really unified. More specifically, Ruby classes are always Java classes. Ruby methods are always Java methods. Ruby objects are always Java objects, and Ruby exceptions are always Java exceptions, and vice versa. Uh, you can take a Java class, and it will look exactly as if it was written in Ruby. When you get an obj a Java object from a Java API, you can call methods on it, it will work. Uh, same runtime, and exactly the same way we implemented Ruby Motion for Objective-C. This is uh, obviously good for performance because there is no bridge, uh, bridging involved here. Also, um, the built-in Ruby classes have been rewritten on top of core Java classes. Again, exactly like Ruby Motion for Objective-C. So I'm, not, I'm just showing you a bunch of classes here. It's not the full list. But string uh, is actually based on Java lar car sequence, which is an interface, not a class. But we have, a, we have our, um, our, our string class, which implements this protocol, uh, this interface, sorry. Java interfaces are a little bit like Objective-C protocols. And there are lots of APIs in Android that expect a Java lar, a Java lang car sequence. One of them is actually the set text method on our text view class. If you remember in my demo, I typed label.text equal a string. And that method expects a Java lar car sequence, so it works. No conversion. 
arrays are actually Java util array list. Hash are actually uh, Java util hash map. The numeric types are based on on the the built-in uh, integer, integer and numeric classes of Java. The big name is actually a Java math big integer. So Java already has a big big name class, so we use it. Why not? Uh, regular expressions are based on the Java regular expression. So a regeps in RubyMotion for Android is a Java util regeps regep pattern, and the match object is a Java util regeps result or something. I don't remember. But the great thing about regular expressions in uh, in for Android is that they use the same library that we actually use uh, in RubyMotion for Objective C. It's called ICU, and so the it behaves more or less the same way. So there won't be any, there won't be any major differences. As far as I know, there shouldn't be any. And finally, uh, Ruby Motion threads are based on Java Lang thread. Uh, threads in, uh, at least in Android, are um, uh, fully POSIX threads. They run completely reentrantly. They are fully concurrent, and the runtime in Ruby Motion for Android is also fully reentrant. So there is no global lock. There is nothing that prevents you from having two threads running at the same time. It is very similar to uh, Remotion for Objective-C. And this one is a bit tricky. Uh, we have memory management. It's completely automated. And it's with completely delegated to uh, the Dalvik virtual machine. But the great thing is that uh, Dalvik has a great garbage collector. It is way better than what iOS has. Honestly, it's like day and night. First, it's generational, so it does a few, it does um, many passes, and it tries to collect uh, young, obje young objects um, quicker than uh, older objects. It's fully concurrent. The, the, the GC runs on separate threads. So, for example, each object can actually be fi finalized in completely uh, other threads than the thread they were actually, b they were actually created. So, it, uh, it's actually very, very nice. And each thread has a per thread allocation pool. So when you do allocations, uh, it's not actually sending messages to another thread. So it's relatively fast. So allocations are actually very nice. I forgot to mention that, but the Android GC also supports, uh, also can, o can obviously resolve uh, retained cycles or cyclic references. That's obviously uh, a fact because they are, uh, they are a real GC. And there are basically two, there are more than two types, but there are mainly two types of references that the runtime creates, the RubyMotion runtime. Uh, the local references are created by default, so every time you call um, a method and that method returns an object, uh, the runtime is going to return a local reference to it. However, if you actually uh, explicitly set a strong, uh, a strong relationship between an object and another, as an example, if you create an instance variable, this is going to create a global reference, but global references are done explicitly. They are done by you. You actually know when you actually create a global references. The destruction of local references is determined at compile time, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. Basically, the compiler determines where local references are no longer needed. However, the destruction of global references is done at runtime. So you, it's really, for example, if you have an, uh, an instance variable and you you set this, is this instance variable to a new value, the older value, which is a global reference, will be destroyed. So it's more like a runtime thing. Yeah, as an example, uh, x equal object.new is a local reference, and at x equal object.new is a global reference. Obviously, when, a, when an object doesn't have any reference to it, it is promoted for garbage collection, and it can die uh, as soon as possible. And since the GC is actually a completely concurrent, it can die right now, because it can happen on a, on a, on a thread running next to the thread you're currently using. So let's, let's take a very quick example. I have a foo method with a few lines. So let's try the first time. I create, I do x equal object.new, and this is going to create an object x. And this is a local reference to my object. Then I do y equal object.new, and this is going to create an object Y. Again, this is a local reference. Now I, I do uh, at Z equal object dot new, and this is going to create an at Z object. But this is a global reference here. Now actually at the end of this line, my object Y dies, 
we actually destroy the local reference. Uh, why exactly? Because if you look at the rest of the method, the, uh, the why local variable is not used anymore. So the compiler knows, hey, we don't need this object anymore. So we just destroy the local reference. And at this point, the object can be destroyed anytime. At least it doesn't have any reference attached to it anymore. Then we can call the bar method, the bar method again, because we like bars. Then we can print the value of x, so it's going to print something. And at the end of this call, obviously, as you can expect, x dies. We destroy the local reference because at the end of this method, we don't use x anymore. And that's all. And the global reference obviously remains alive. And as long as the object remains alive, uh, or object uh, at Z will remain alive. So I hope that was clear. But an anyway, we have documentation for it. So uh, now I'm going to just talk quickly about the compiler. And the compiler is based on LVM, obviously. So uh, we, uh, the Ruby files are actually statically compiled into machine code. So in Ruby Motion 400 app, we don't use Java at all. We compile straight to ARM code. Very similar to how iOS and OS X applications are, are compiled. So this is straight machine code. As an example, if we have our main activity with one method on create, it's going to generate this LVM uh, instant representation. We actually have two functions. Uh, the first one is going to be act you have a message. <laughs> it's actually your wife. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's okay. So the first one is actually uh, the implementation of the onCreate method. So this is the Ruby code that will be compiled to machine code, pure Ruby. And then we, we generate a second um, function here. It's at uh, 2881. It's actually a unique number. We don't control that. And that method will actually be the one that will be inserted into the Java runtime. So we use GNI for that. GNI uh, provides you a way to register native methods. And this function actually complies to the GNI uh, expected interface. The first argument is actually a GNI environment. And the other ones are the Java arguments. So we need to convert some of the types from Java to Ruby. Uh, actually, most of the time, this OCVAR to RVAR will just pass away the pointer because there is no conversion needed. Sometimes we might have to convert certain types. Then we can invoke our method defined earlier, and then we can just rescue exceptions and do things. But basically, what I wh would like to show you is that the Ruby stuff is always compiled into machine code and registered into the Java runtime. And this is, by the way, the exact same way we do remotion for Objective-C again. Very similar. The compiler will also generate DEX bytecode for Java interface, for classes interfaces. The reason is that in Android, well, at least in the GNI implementation of Android, it is not allowed to create classes at runtime. They don't implement the full spec of the, of the GNI specification, so you cannot create classes at runtime, sadly. So for that, we need to create the DEX bytecode to actually create the classes. But the, the, the methods are truly native, but the class structure is DEX bytecode. So as an example, we here we have our, uh, a new class with two methods, on create and on touch, sorry, dispatch touch event. And we're going to generate uh, this dex bytecode. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, dex bytecode is the bytecode we, we read at runtime by Dalvik. And here we actually have two virtual methods. As you can see, we have dispatch touch event and on create. And we just define, expose them. And before that, we actually expose our main activity. And we say that is a super class of Android app activity. All this stuff is created by the compiler for you. If you look careful, you will see that the access of each virtual method is public native. Native means that the code is not there. The code is not by code. The code is machine code uh, somewhere else. We emit, uh, the compiler emits dwarf metadata, which is sp very specific support to provide uh, proper uh, debugging information. So as an example, if you dwarf, uh, dwarf dump the library that we generate, you will see a bunch of information. You will see that we have uh, file and source line information right there. So if you have an, uh, an app that creates an exception at runtime, like we call foo, and then foo call does not exist, uh, you will get an exception, and you will get the proper file and line information, which is something you expect, but it, we had to, I had to write it. 
And finally, a very quick talk about the build system. The build system uh, takes all the RB files and all the resource files and generates an APK for you. So if we look inside the APK, it's actually a, a zip archive. So you can just unzip it and look what's inside. And you will see that there are a bunch of files. The first one is uh, libpayload.so. It's a shared library that contains both the source code, uh, sorry, the, the machine code of all your RB files and also the machine code for the RubyMotion runtime. So it's all zipped into um, a shell library. And uh, RubyMotion for Android apps are using NDK, the native uh, development kit that allows you to have uh, machine code and Java code at the same time. And this code would just be loaded at runtime. Then you have an Android manifest.xml file, which is the project's configuration or, um, yeah, project configura configuration. And it is, it is very similar to the info.plist file that you have in Objective-C project. And this file is actually generated based on values in your rake file. So you don't actually create it. It's done for you. Then you have the classes.dex, which is the dex bytecode for the class uh, structures of your program. So again, it only contains the class interface, not the, uh, not the real code. The real code is in the libpayload.so library. Then you have a resource directory where all the resource files of your app will actually be there. And you can have both uh, raw resources, like assets, and then uh, application level resources, like all the XML files I was talking about. You can have both of them in the project. And the build system is smart enough to do that. And it will also generate the famous r.java class so that you can actually access these resources from the code. That's an Android thing, but it's there. And finally, there is a uh, meta uh, dash inf directory which contains the code signing information for your app. So if you actually uh, create a release build, it will contain the, your uh, public key, the public key of your key store that you generated. And there is something I forgot to mention is that the conference app I show you a few minutes ago, it's actually uh, on the Google Play Store. I submitted it and they approved it in Two, two or three hours. Actually, they, they don't. They don't even approve thing. I, I think they just, just automate it. So this is another great thing about Android. You can, well, a great thing and a bad thing, I guess. But the app is there. So if you have an Android device, you can try it. Uh, you will see that it's two megabyte. It's actually because it bundles the Google Play uh, services library, which is already two megabyte. So the the application is not that fat. It's just that library that we ship. This is for the, the maps view, by the way. It runs on pretty much all the Android uh, devices I could find, which is my Nexus 7 tablet and Colin's phone. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it's going to run on all the Android devices. Actually, when you submit this, it says that you, have, um, you can generate 200 uh, devices. Anyway, so let's recap. Remotion 3.0. We have performance improvements, we have faster development cycles, thanks to code reloading, and we have Android support. So you can finally create Android apps in Ruby, you can share code between iOS, OS X, and Android apps, and you use the same experience. So no Eclipse on uh, Android, no Xcode on Objective-C, use the same, same development experience. So this is a preview of RubyMotion 3.0. This is a sneak peek. Uh, the only reason we are showing it to you today is because uh, we need your, your help to actually make sure we can deliver it to everyone. So we cannot uh, give Remotion Tree to everyone at this point. It's still an, in early development, and we, are re we really need uh, help from the community. Which comes to my last slide. We need you. <laughs> so um, let starting from today, actually um, a little bit uh, further in the, in the day, uh, we'll do a blog post on our post, and we actually ask for uh, interested developers to actually try early builds of RubyMotion 3. And we really need your help because, especially for the Android support, the Android support is brand new. It's a new implementation of Ruby. And when, when we ship RubyMotion for iOS, it was already based on MacRuby, something I, I worked on for five years. So it was well tested and solid. This is not solid. This is <laughs> brand new. So we really need your help. And we're looking for a bunch of profiles. We're looking for people with gems that may exist in Android. So I'm thinking of you, Motion Kit, Bubble Wrap, uh, ProMotion, 
all the stuff that may make sense on Android and you want to port it. And also if you have applications on the on the Apple App Store and would like to port it to Android uh, and would like to try early builds, you're welcome. And we really need people who are able to deal with uh, frustration and pain because there will be bugs and we will need you guys to report us feedback and make sure we can test early builds. And hopefully we can deliver Ruby Motion 3 to everyone uh, later this year. It, but we will actually ship it when it's uh, good enough for us. And that's all. Thank you very much.